Leper entered ahead of the other two. He looked unusually well. His eyes were bright. His manner was all energy. His voice was clear. Yes? What can I do for you? Brinker began talking to him in the elaborately casual manner of someone being watched. He never raised his voice, but instead he let the noise surrounding it gradually sink so that his voice emerged in the ensuing silence without any emphasis on his part. So that you were standing next to the river bank, watching Phineas climb the tree. Sure, right there by the trunk of the tree. I was looking up. It was almost sunset, and I remembered the way the sun was shining in my eyes. So you couldn't... I began before I could stop myself. There was a short pause, and then Brinker went on. And could you see anything with the sun in your eyes? Oh, sure, said Leper in his new confident false voice. I just shaded my eyes a little, like this, and then I could see. I could see both of them clearly enough because the sun was blazing all around them, and the rays of the sun were shooting past them. The two of them looked as black as... as black as death standing up there with this fire burning all around them. Everyone could hear, couldn't they? The derangement in his voice. Up there where? Brinker said brusquely. Where were the two of them standing up there? On the limb. Who was where on the limb? Which one was ahead of the other? Leper smiled waggishly. I couldn't see that. There were just two shapes. One of them was next to the trunk, holding on to the trunk of the tree, and the other one was a little farther out on the limb. Then what happened? Then they both moved. How did they move? They moved. Now Leper was smiling, a charming and slightly arched smile like a child who knows he is going to say something clever. They moved like an engine. In the baffled silence, I began to uncoil slowly. I can't think of the name of the engine, but it has two pistons. Anyway, in this engine, first one piston sinks, and then the next one sinks. The one holding on to the trunk sank for a second, up and down like a piston, and then the other one sank. Someone on the platform exclaimed, The one who moved first shook the other one's balance. Phineas had gotten up unnoticed from his chair. I don't care. I don't care. I tore myself from the bench toward him. Phineas! He shook his head sharply, closing his eyes, and then he turned to regard me with a handsome mask of face. I just don't care. Never mind. And he started across the marble floor toward the doors. Wait a minute, cried Brinker. We haven't heard everything yet. We haven't got all the facts. The words shocked Phineas into awareness. He whirled as though being attacked from behind. You get the rest of the facts, Brinker. You get all your facts. I had never seen Finny crying. You collect every fucking fact there is in the world. He plunged out the doors. The excellent exterior acoustics recorded his rushing steps and the quick wrapping of his cane along the corridor and on the first steps of the marble stairway. Then, these separate sounds collided into the general tumult of his body, falling clumsily down the white marble stairs. The foyer and the staircase of the first building were soon as crowded as at midday. When Dr. Stanpole arrived, there was silence on the stairs. After a short, silent examination... Dr. Stanpole had a chair brought from the assembly room, and Finney was lifted cautiously into it. As they raised him up, he looked very strange to me, like some tragic and exalted personage. Once again, I had the desolating sense of having all along ignored what was finest in him. He went past with his eyes closed and his mouth tense. Dr. Stanpole stopped near the doors, looking for the light switch. There was an interval of a few seconds when no one was near him. I came up to him and tried to phrase my question, but nothing came out. Dr. Stanpole, without appearing to notice my tangle, said, It's the leg again, broken again, but a much cleaner break, I think. Much cleaner. A simple fracture. He found the light switch, and the foyer was plunged into darkness. 
I made my way across campus and walked noiselessly up the emerging grass next to the infirmary driveway. I turned the corner of the building and began to creep along behind it. There was only one window lighted at the far end. It was too high for me to see directly in. I sprang as high as I could and saw a head and shoulders partially turned away from me. Dr. Stampole. This was the room. The ground was too damp to sit on, so I crouched down and waited. I could hear their blurred voices droning monotonously through the window. If they do nothing worse, they're going to bore Finney to death, I said to myself. My head seemed to be full of bright remarks this evening. It was cold. I stood up and jumped several times, not so much to see into the room as to warm up. What could they be talking about? The night nurse had always been the biggest windbag in the school, Miss Windbag R.N. Dr. Stanpole was fairly gabby, too. What was he always saying? Nothing. He talked in a huge circle. He probably had a million words in his vocabulary, and he had to use them all before he started over again. That's probably the way they were talking in there now. Dr. Stanpole was working his way as fast as possible around his big circle. Miss Windbag was gasping out something or other all the time. Phineas, of course, was answering them only in Latin. I nearly laughed out loud at that. And what about if Finney said, Dr. Stanpole, old pal, you're the most long-winded licensed medical man alive. And it would be even funnier... If he interrupted the night nurse and said, Miss Windbag, you're rotten, rotten to the core. I just thought I ought to tell you. It would never occur to Finney to say any of these things, but they struck me as so outrageous that I couldn't stop myself from laughing. I put my hand over my mouth, and then I tried to stop my mouth with my fist. If I couldn't get control of this laughing, they would hear me in the room. I dug my teeth into my fist to try to gain control. And then I noticed there were tears all over my hand. The engine of Dr. Stampole's car roared exhaustedly. The headlights turned in an erratic arc away from me, and then I heard the engine recede into the distance. The light had gone out in the room, and there was no sound coming from it. I came up close beneath the window, found a foothold on the grating beneath it, and since I was convinced that the window would be stuck shut, I pushed it hard. The window shot up and there was a startled rustling from the bed in the shadows. I whispered, Finny, sharply into the black room. Who is it? He demanded, leaning out from the bed. Then he recognized me. I thought at first he was going to get out of bed. He struggled clumsily for such a length of time that even my mind, shocked and slowed as it had been, was able to formulate two realizations. That his leg was bound so that he could not move very well and that he was struggling to unleash his hate against me. You want to break something else in me? Is that why you're here? He thrashed wildly in the darkness, but he could not even get up from the bed. He arched out, lunging hopelessly in the space between us and fell, his legs still on the bed, his hands slapping loudly against the floor. Then, after a pause, all the tension drained out of him, and he brought his head slowly down between his hands and rested it against the floor not moving, not making any sound. I'm sorry, I said blindly. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had just control enough to stay out of his room, to let him struggle back into the bed by himself. I slid down from the window. I remember lying on the ground, staring up at the night sky, which was neither clear nor overcast. And I remember later walking alone down a rather aimless road. I saw the gym in the glow of a couple of lights outside near it, and there was something strange about it. It seemed to alter moment by moment before my eyes, becoming, for brief flashes, a totally unknown building with a significance much deeper and far more real than any I had noticed before. Along the lower end of the playing fields and under the pale night glow, the fields swept away from me, in slight frosty undulations which bespoke levels of reality I had never suspected before. They unrolled away impervious to me as though I were a roaming ghost, not only tonight but always, as though I had never played on them a hundred times, as though my whole life at Devon had been a dream, or rather that everything at Devon 
the playing fields, the buildings, and all the people were intensely real, and I alone was a dream, a figment which had never really touched anything. I felt that I was not, never had been, and never would be a living part of this overpoweringly solid and deeply meaningful world around me, because I did not exist. I woke the next morning in a dry and fairly sheltered corner of the ramp underneath the stadium. My neck was stiff from sleeping in an awkward position. The sun was high and the air freshened. I walked back to the center of the school and had breakfast, and then went to my room to get a notebook. At the door of the room I found a note from Dr. Stanpole. Please bring some of Finney's clothes and his toilet things to the infirmary. I tried to calm myself as I walked with Finney's suitcase toward the infirmary. After all, I reflected to myself. People were shooting flames into caves and grilling other people alive. Ships were being torpedoed and dropping thousands of men into the icy ocean. Whole city blocks were exploding into flame in an instant. My brief burst of animosity, lasting only a second, a part of a second, something which came before I could recognize it and was gone before I knew it had possessed me, what was that in the midst of this holocaust? The infirmary corridor happened to be empty. I knocked on the door to Finney's room and went in. He was sitting up in bed, leafing through a magazine. I carried my head low by instinct, and I had the courage for only a short glance at him before I said quietly, I brought your stuff. Put the suitcase on the bed here, will you? The tone of his words filled dead center, without a trace of friendliness or unfriendliness. I put it down beside him and he opened it and began to look through the extra underwear and shirts and socks I had packed. I stood precariously in the middle of the room, trying to find somewhere to look and something to say, wanting desperately to leave and powerless to do so. Phineas went carefully over his clothes, apparently very calm, but it wasn't like him to check with such care. And then I noticed that as he tried to slide a hairbrush out from under a flap holding it in the case, his hands were shaking so badly that he couldn't get it out. Seeing that released me on the spot. Finney, I tried to tell you before. I tried to tell you when I came to Boston that time. I know. I remember that. What'd you come around here for last night? I don't know. I went over to the window and placed my hands on the sill. I had to. I thought I belonged here. I felt him turning to look at me, and so I looked up. He had a particular expression which his face assumed when he understood, but didn't think he should show it, a settled, enlightened look. He suddenly slammed his fist against the suitcase. I wish to God there wasn't any war. I looked sharply at him. What made you say that? I don't know if I can take this with a war on. What good are you in a war with a busted leg? He bent over the suitcase again. I've been writing to the Army and the Navy and the Marines and the Canadians and everybody else all winter. Did you know that? No, you didn't know that. I used the post office in town for my return address. They all gave me the same answer after they saw the medical report on me. The answer was no soap. We can't use you. I also wrote to the Coast Guard, the Merchant Marine. I wrote to General de Gaulle personally. I also wrote Chiang Kai-shek. And I was about ready to write somebody in Russia. I made an attempt at a grin. You wouldn't like it in Russia. I'll hate it everywhere if I'm not in this war. Why do you think I kept saying there wasn't any war all winter? Finney. Phineas, you wouldn't be any good in the war, even if nothing had happened to your leg. A look of amazement fell over him. It scared me, but I knew what I said was important and right. They'd get you some place at the front, and there'd be a lull in the fighting, and the next thing anyone knew, you'd be over there with the Germans or the Japs asking them if they'd like to feel a baseball team against our side. You'd be sitting in one of their command posts, teaching them English. You'd get things so scrambled up, nobody'd know who to fight anymore. You'd make a mess, a terrible mess out of the war. His face had been struggling to stay calm as he listened to me, but now he was crying, but trying to control himself. It was just some kind of blind impulse you had in the tree there. You didn't know what you were doing. Was that it? Yes. Yes, that was it. Oh, that was it. But 
How can you believe that? How can you believe that? I can't even make myself pretend that you could believe that. I do. I think I can believe that. I've gotten awfully mad sometimes and almost forgotten what I was doing. I think I believe you. Then that was it. Something just seized you. It wasn't anything you really felt against me. It wasn't some kind of hate you felt all along. It wasn't anything personal. No. I don't know how to show you. How can I show you, Finny? Tell me how to show you. It was just some ignorance inside me. Some crazy thing inside me. Something blind. That's all it was. He was nodding his head, his jaw tightening and his eyes closed on the tears. I believe you. It's okay because I understand and I believe you. You've already shown me and I believe you. The rest of the day passed quickly. Dr. Stanpole had told me in the corridor that he was going to set the bone that afternoon. Come back around five o'clock, he had said, when Finney should be coming out of the anesthesia. At 4.45, I went to the infirmary. I sat down on a bench amid the medical smells and waited. After about ten minutes, Dr. Stanpole came walking rapidly out of his office, his head down and his hands sunk in the pockets of his white smock. He didn't notice me until he was almost past me, and then he stopped short. His eyes met mine carefully, and I said, Well, how is he, sir? Dr. Stanpole sat down next to me and put his capable-looking hand on my leg. This is something I think boys of your generation are going to see a lot of, and I will have to tell you about it now. Your friend is dead. He was incomprehensible. I felt an extremely cold chill along my back and neck. That was all. Dr. Stanpole went on. It was such a simple, clean break. Anyone could have said it. Of course I didn't send him to Boston. Why should I? In the middle of it, his heart simply stopped, without warning. I can't explain it. Yes, I, I can. There is only one explanation. As I was moving the bone, some of the marrow must have escaped into his bloodstream and gone directly to his heart and stopped it. That's the only possible explanation. The only one. There are risks. There are always risks. An operating room is a place where the risks are just more formal than in other places. An operating room in a war. Why did it have to happen to you boys so soon? Here at Devon. The marrow of his bone. I repeated aimlessly. This at last penetrated my mind. Phineas had died from the marrow of his bone flowing down his bloodstream to his heart. I did not cry then or ever about Finney. I did not cry even when I stood watching him being lowered into his family's straight-laced burial ground outside of Boston. I could not escape a feeling that this was my own funeral, and you do not cry in that case. The quadrangle surrounding the Far Common was never considered absolutely essential to the Devon School. The essence was elsewhere, in the older, uglier, more comfortable halls enclosing the center common. The far common was different, a gift of a rich lady benefactress. It was not the essence of Devon, and so it was donated, without too serious a wrench, to the war. It could be seen from the window of my room, and early in June I stood at the window and watched the war, moving in to occupy it. The advance guard which came down the street from the railroad station consisted of a number of jeeps being driven with a certain restraint. Following them there were some heavy trucks painted olive drab, and behind them came the troops. What's in those trucks? Brinker said. They look like sewing machines, I said. I guess a parachute rigger school has to have sewing machines. If only Leper had enlisted in the Army Air Force and been assigned to a parachute rigger school. Right, I said. Now, do you mind? 
Why talk about something you can't do anything about? Right. I had to be right in never talking about what you could not change. And I had to make many people agree that I was right. None of them ever accused me of being responsible for what had happened to Phineas, either because they could not believe it or else because they could not understand it. I would have talked about that, but they would not, and I would not talk about Phineas in any other way. The jeeps, troops, and sewing machines were now drawn up next to the far common quadrangle. Around them spread a beautiful New England day. Peace lay on Devon like a blessing. The summer's peace. The company fell out and began scattering through the far common. Dad's here, said Brinker. He's in my room. He wants to meet you. Mr. Hadley stood up and shook my hand with genuine cordiality when we came in. He was a distinguished-looking man, taller than Brinker so that his portliness was not very noticeable. You boys are the image of me and my gang in the old days. It does me good to see you. What are you enlisting in, son? He said, meaning me. The Marines? The paratroops? There are doggone many exciting things to enlist in these days. There's that bunch they call the frogmen. Underwater demolition stuff. I'd give something to be a kid again with all that to choose from. I was going to wait and be drafted, I replied, trying to be polite and answer his question honestly. But if I did that... They might put me straight in the infantry, and that's not only the dirtiest, but also the most dangerous branch, the worst branch of all. So, I've joined the Navy, and they're sending me to Pensacola. I'll probably have a lot of training, and I'll never see a foxhole. I hope. I saw that he didn't care for the sound of what I said. He nodded slightly, looking at the floor, and then said, You have to do what you think is right, but just make sure it's the right thing in the long run and not just for the moment. Your war memories will be with you forever. You'll be asked about them thousands of times after the war is over. People will get their respect for you from that. Well, partly from that, don't get me wrong. But if you can say that you were up front, where there was some real shooting going on, then that will mean a whole lot to you in the years to come. Now I know you. I feel I know you, Jane, as well as I know Brink here. You want to serve. That's all. It's your greatest moment, greatest privilege to serve your country. We're all proud of you. And we're all old guys like me. We're all darn jealous of you, too. I could see that Brinker was more embarrassed by this than I was. His father stiffened, paused, then relaxed with an effort. Your mother's out in the car. I'd better get back to her. Uh, you boys clean up uh, those shoes. Brink, a little polish? And we'll see you at the end at six. Okay, Dad. His father left, trailing the faint, prosperous aroma of his cigar. Dad keeps making that speech about serving the country, Brinker said apologetically. I wish to hell he wouldn't. I'm enlisting. I'm going to serve, as he puts it. I may even get killed, but I'll be damned if I'll have that Nathan Hale attitude of his about it. It's all that World War I malarkey that gets me. They're all children about that war. Did you ever notice? Well, he's just trying to keep up with the times. He probably feels left out, being too old this time. Left out? Brinker's eyes lighted up. Left out? He and his crowd are responsible for it, and we're going to fight it. I had heard this generation complaint from Brinker before so often that I finally identified this as the source of his disillusionment during the winter, this generalized, faintly self-pitying resentment against millions of people he did not know. In a way, this was Finney's view, except that naturally he saw it comically, as a huge and intensely practical joke played by fat and foolish old men bungling away behind the scenes. I could never agree with either of them. It would have been comfortable but I could not believe it, because it seemed clear that wars were not made by generations and their special stupidities, but that wars were made instead by something ignorant in the human heart. Brinker went upstairs to continue his packing, and I walked over to the gym to clean out my locker. As I crossed the far common, I saw that it was rapidly becoming unrecognizable. 
the ground punctuated by white markers identifying offices and areas and also certain less tangible things, a kind of snap in the atmosphere, a professional optimism, a conscious maintenance of high morale. I myself had often been happy at Devon, but such times it seemed to me that afternoon were over now. Happiness had disappeared along with rubber, silk, and many other staples, to be replaced by the wartime synthetic high morale for the duration. I never talked about Phineas, and neither did anyone else. He was, however, present in every moment of every day. During the time I was with him, Phineas created an atmosphere in which I continued now to live, a way of sizing up the world with erratic and entirely personal reservations, letting its rock-like facts sift through and be accepted only a little at a time, only as much as he could assimilate, without a sense of chaos and loss. No one else I have ever met could do this. All others, at some point, found something in themselves pitted violently against something in the world around them. With those of my year, this point often came when they grasped the fact of the war, when they began to feel that there was this overwhelmingly hostile thing in the world with them. Then the simplicity and unity of their characters broke, and they were not the same again. Phineas alone had escaped this. He possessed an extra vigor, a heightened confidence in himself, a serene capacity for affection, which saved him. Nothing as he was growing up at home, nothing at Devon, nothing even about the war had broken his harmonious and natural unity. So at last I had. From my locker I collected my sneakers, jockstrap and gym pants and then turned away, leaving the door ajar for the first time. This was more final than the moment when the headmaster handed me my diploma. My schooling was over now. I walked down the aisle past the rows of lockers and followed the Army Air Force out onto the playing fields of Devon. A high wooden platform had been erected there, and on it stood a barking instructor, giving rows of men below him calisthenics by the numbers. I was ready for the war, now that I no longer had any hatred to contribute to it. My fury was gone. I felt it gone, dried up at the source, withered and lifeless. Phineas had absorbed it and taken it with him, and I was rid of it forever. I never killed anybody, and I never developed an intense level of hatred for the enemy, because my war ended before I ever put on a uniform. I was on active duty all my time at school. I killed my enemy there. Only Phineas never was afraid. Only Phineas never hated anyone. Other people experienced this fearful shock somewhere, this sighting of the enemy, and so began an obsessive labor of defense, began to parry the menace they saw facing them by developing a particular frame of mind, like Brinker, developing a careless general resentment against it, or like Leper, emerging from a protective cloud of vagueness only to meet it, the horror, face to face, just as he had always feared and so giving up the struggle absolutely. All of them, all except Phineas, constructed at infinite cost to themselves these Maginot lines against this enemy they thought they saw across the frontier, this enemy who never attacked that way, if he ever attacked at all, if he was indeed the enemy. been listening to A Separate Piece by John Knowles, read by Matthew Modine. The music was composed by Peter Wetzler. This audio tape was adapted, directed, and produced by Stuart Lee and Real World Audio. We hope you've enjoyed listening to A Separate Piece by John Knowles. Available in paperback by Bantam, wherever books are sold. 
also available by John Knowles, Peace Breaks Out. For a complete list of tapes, please write to Bantam Audio Publishing. Copyright 1987, Bantam Audio Publishing.